so for anybody who doesn't know you, would you just introduce yourself and sure. how whatever you want viewers to know about you and what you do? Oyster related. And, yes, oyster, oyster related, related Joe. I'm little Joey Oyster. <laughs> My friends call me at least. I am, I guess, the founder of the Oyster Culture Foundation, and I've been researching and studying oysters and what they do for about 18 or more years, and only really getting started with actual restoration bioremediation work recently in the last two years. Okay, so for people who know nothing about what you're doing, which is me, actually, because I just heard about this, but anyone else watching too, I want to know what can an oyster do that we should understand in this conversation. I think right it's now. important to understand that oysters are worth more in the water than they are on your plate. Is a message we're trying to send to people. Yeah, say more about that. What do you mean? Filter over 50 gallons a day per oyster, and they live for upwards of 25 or more years. The average being about 10 years, because people tend to eat them really quickly. Most of the native indigenous species of oysters, the oyster beds of old, are gone and harvested and dredged to form things like the Oakland Airport, Alameda, the Ikea parking lot in Berkeley, and Market Street in San Francisco are all paved and leveled and brought up above sea level with oysters historically. Part of what that does to the ecosystem and the environment is leaves it without its natural filter, without, without a way to um, remove pollutants from the water, take the water quality and make it clear again, so fish and aquatic life can return and also it just really leaves a kind of a devastation effect because most people the reason those oysters are missing in the beginning in history it was most the indigenous people of the san francisco bay area were sustained by eating shellfish and making shell mounds and that being removed in the current day is not only a travesty to the environment but it's also difficult for lower income people to then continue to find food mm -hmm. of the sea so there's a couple okay, so, of folds to the yeah area. so i want to back up a little bit because you talked about filtering a couple times i mean again for anybody who knows nothing about oysters and this like what's the problem and then what's the solution that oysters can provide in this filtering process the problem is an abundance of pollution so great that the oysters that are native in here can't really breed or replicate on their own spawning rates are 10,000 young oysters, baby oysters per breeding pair, and the survival rate is less than 1%. And um, is that because people are taking them to eat them, or what? That's because ocean, a couple of factors, three factors mainly. One is ocean has become very acidic, and so their shells in a small beginning state can't really develop very well, and they get mushy and they get eaten by fish. Secondarily, if they do survive and form a hardy shell, there's nowhere for them to attach because for shipping traffic, the bay has been dredged. Mm -hmm. And for boat navigation, the bay has also been cleared and dredged of a lot of obstructions and things. And a lot of creosote pilings have been added. And those surfaces, the oysters don't attach to. So really it's just muck. And when you know, an oyster lands in the muck, it's, it's covered by more muck and it can't survive. And so if a lot I'm of them are lost. So if I'm understanding this right, we need oysters in the water versus on our plate because oysters naturally can filter the water think you know i heard you say earlier things like oil pollutants yeah they crude. clean the ocean water am i understanding that correctly correct yeah, yeah. even petroleum crude oil microplastics these things i've oh, seen even microplastics that's fascinating yeah even can be pulled from the water column not to mention nitrates and other runoff elements that end up in the water mm -hmm. due to farming or refined oil from boat motor spills or crude oil from a parking lot in the rain a fresh parking lot will have a lot of runoff with crude oil so these sensors that we're wanting to be working with will detect all of those factors and show us what's happening when the oysters are in place so it basically would be having the initial project is having a, a a sensor in the ambient water in the bay, and then the second sensor surrounded by a sort of a cylinder of oysters with it in the center, mm -hmm. and showing what they can remove and recording that very accurately in order to document it, to prove their filtration viability. Yeah. Our main goal. And at this point, have you had any 
like prototypes of this? Have you tested this or is this all kind of still theoretical, but you need, you want to test it? Like, where are you in the process? Besides our this? organization, there's a lot of organizations that do this kind of work. The water keepers of Maui have 1,200 oysters in the Maui Harbor as part of their pilot for the same type of project. There are a lot of people in San Francisco Bay and also in Chesapeake Bay that are doing oyster restoration work. Their work is involving like putting concrete substrate in the muck. So the oysters then native ones can attach on their own, letting it happen sort of naturally. But their recruitment rates on those concrete structures are very low. And in one of our baskets that's been in for two years with a hundred oysters in it, not only are the oysters growing to be eight or nine inches large, but also there are small native oysters. We counted 40 oysters per cubic foot of recruitment within our basket. So not only are we putting oysters that cannot breed, they're sterile, into a basket solely for the purpose of filtering the water. But because they are there with their little heartbeats and their filtration is happening, they do have a heartbeat, the other oysters are attracted. And as they're, the baby oyster is in a, it's called spat. And in its microscopic size, it can actually move around and it detects calcium signatures. It has a pleus that can help propel it through the water. And so they choose to move towards the other oysters. So. Our organization is basically called oyster culture because if you create a good culture like in a city or something with oysters others will join mm -hmm. and so the native species has been really attracted to our baskets and, and what's happening within them and again our oysters aren't really for eating the ones in the i was going to say you, you should not eat these oysters right right so we're asking we're actually the whole goal right now is just to create a lot of awareness mm -hmm. letting people know that oysters can clean the water and like, if they are replaced in a large volume, there's documented things on the internet you can find where about 1,300 oysters can take the place of a waste treatment facility. Wow. And removing even, you know, feces from the water. Mm -hmm. In Australia, there are oysters in a waste treatment facility trying to prove that on a very, like, high volume scale. That's really cool. But a lot of these projects are pilot projects, and a lot of them don't involve a scope that is cleaning the global ocean yeah and that's where we're wanting to do with oyster culture is and make it very easily replicable for anybody to get involved with stewardship and putting oysters under their boat dock or under their yachts or under their houseboat mm -hmm. we even have some people that took a walking tour with us and they were really excited about it and wondered if they could even rent a boat dock slip just to put the oysters in hmm. and maintain it themselves and cool. like a group and they just do that themselves. So. Yeah. So what would be the grand vision if you had like all the funding you needed, all the resources you needed, like what, where could you see this potentially going in terms of just what this could mean for our world if, if this could, if, if you had no limitations? Well, no limitations would be two billion oysters in San Francisco Bay and let that happen for a year or two and see how the water quality of the entire bay is is improved or not and very logically it would be and then replicating it elsewhere moving on to every bay mm -hmm. in the United States and then throughout the world as well would be ideal just to start reversing what human activity has done to the ocean environment and one of the things I like to tell kids about is to like consider the the i want to write like a storybook sort mm -hmm. of about consider it. the oyster consider the oyster that's mm -hmm. just a little joey oyster on the reef mm -hmm. and you know this was a 200 years ago and the, the home reef gets bulldozed into the oakland airport tarmac and the little oyster survives and he sort of like finds buddies to help him clean the water and restore the bay. So there's a, anyway, there's, for, the, for, for kids, it's to consider the indigenous community that was under the water in the 1800s mm -hmm. before the bridges were built and what was going on, and what, was, what, what, what it was like to live here and be in an underwater environment living around here. I think yeah. is a, something of importance because it's very different now than it was 200 years ago. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the indigenous community in the beginning and I'm curious if you can come back to that and just talk a little more about like what they were doing. Do you see that as a model to follow or is it was that actually the start of people eating oysters? 
In the start of people eating oysters, I have a map on the website that's of like 1820, 24, mm -hmm. and it's before the bridges were built. And it shows a shipping chart, and it shows about one third of San Francisco Bay, 66,000 acres are covered in oysters. Oyster beds, it says it's innavigable due to oyster beds and due to dead oysters. And the fact that it says the dead oysters on the map is evident to me that people have been eating them. Because with 200 years ago, the water quality is very pure. Yes, oysters do die, but when oysters die, their shells are then re-inhabited by baby oysters. Oh, interesting. And so looking into a lot of Native American heritage and the tribes that were here and finding a lot of really good evidence that really paints a picture that these oyster shoals, as they would be, were the main source of food for these people. And in order to get out to the reef, you need to take a canoe. And at low tide, if you are constantly going back and forth from the reef in a canoe, you can replace these dead oyster shells in the water. And I believe what they were noticing due to the tide charts and showing that the, you basically could walk then to the oyster reef after eating and collecting and redepositing the shells, they made a, it possible for you to walk to the reef without, at low tide without canoeing, which then you could bring everybody with you and haul back. Mm -hmm. a ton more oysters and also putting dead shells in the water would encourage recruitment of the native oysters to settle and then creating food for the next season after a year or two the oysters are big enough to eat mm -hmm. and they would come back and eat them i think that's a sustainable way sort of to manage the ocean mm -hmm. um, could that be a sustainable way for people to eat continue to eat oysters who if we have any oyster lovers that don't want to I Stop think eating oysters? Eating like, is in, there an answer to that? Well, I think eating them in a sustainable way involves, we have a Bucks for Shucks campaign, and we've asked a lot of oyster farms and companies and people, just restaurants that sell oysters, to get involved. But it's every oyster that you eat or you purchase, you donate a dollar in order to replace one oyster into the interest, into bioremediation really, to help clean the water. So each oyster we put in never comes out. It stays in there until it chokes and dies on pollution. Mm -hmm. And then it's whatever it's eating is bio remineralized into its shell formation or it's excreted in like what's called suedo feces which is pelletized poop that mm -hmm. uh, goes to the bottom except it's not really poop it's the their filter feeders so they're there's as they're feeding the oyster itself in its body is sorting and bringing edible things into the interior of its body However, if they encounter something like petroleum or a microplastic or a rock or a piece of sand, it's going to then expel it around its shell on the inside and secrete nacre on it so it can slip through and come out the other side. And that's called the suedo feces, these little pellets. It's almost like a, like a, a little mini pearl or a, a pill tablet, like a pollution that's going to be capsuled. And once those, because they secrete on it, there's a lack of water on the inside and it's just petroleum or just the pollutant they then sink to the bottom where the anaerobic bacteria can break down the pollutants and keep them sequestered below mm -hmm. and keep them out of the water column where they end up in animals and things like that. Yeah. Or in loss of energy. Okay, so this may be a question that you don't know the answer to, but if you could, you know, meet some very generous billionaire, trillionaire, whatever, tomorrow, who was like, I want to fund your project to make your dream happen. Do I you have a sense of, a bunch yeah, of like what, coin. well, yeah, what would you ask them for to make this happen, like even just in San Francisco? Well, right now we're creating awareness of the farmer's market, just marketing mm -hmm. to people by showing them an aquarium full of oysters that are filtering the water every 20, 30 minutes, 30 oysters, clean, real bay water that mm -hmm. is polluted that I bring and dump it into the aquarium. But people are, we have a sort of created an environmental token. So we call it Pearl Coin and it powers our restoration or bioremediation. Each coin is represents one slot in a enclosure that's always full of an oyster with an oyster in it, always filtering. And so if an oyster would die two or three years, five years, 10 years in, we'd remove it. We do about a yearly cycling on these baskets and then replace it with an oyster that is alive again and mm -hmm. start the process over again but for each coin it's 15 dollars at the moment that would then remove at least 15 pounds of pollution or pollutants from the water column so that's what we're so looking 15 for. 15 bucks for 15 pounds is kind of what you're it's like a dollar a pound yeah. to remove yeah. the pollutants there's a similar oyster credit in maryland and they they are the ones that have the metrics down on the oyster reef 
replacing the waste treatment facility and they have the metrics down on the pearl or the they call it an oyster credit so it's all about like a net zero or like a zero carbon emissions for businesses over there they're saying that if you're a polluting business then you put 10,000 pounds of pollution you need to spend ten thousand dollars to buy ten thousand oyster credits the oyster credits the oyster credit equals <clears throat> on the maryland website that one three and a half inch oyster normal eating size remains in the oyster farm in the water for one full year before harvest making it worth and removing one pound of pollution in that period of time okay and it's kind of complicated but one oyster one year one pound is pretty simple mm -hmm. metrics and that's right that's what they're doing then the oyster gets harvested and sold and eat stopping its filtration but in bioremediation and in, in our bioremediation enclosures the oysters live in perpetuity mm -hmm. so just starting at a 10-year scope it's worth about 15 times more to have an oyster in bioremediation because they grow larger mm -hmm. than three and a half inches and then they're in there for about 10 years. So the one pearl credit, pearl, pearl token is comparable to the oyster credit and mm -hmm. the oyster credit would be worth one and the pearl coin token would be worth about 15 times more because the oyster is growing and it's in the water in sure. two. Yeah. So at least 15 times the value. So right now we're working on determining the fair market value of, of those credits. So, so if, you, if you were to ask some trillionaire to fund your project, what would you ask for? <laughs> that might, this you, be... might not, you might not have that number on the fly, but I'm curious, like in the San Francisco Bay, how many of these oyster credits would you need to make this happen? Two, two billion. Two billion dollars. Two billion dollars would be yeah. enough to, to put two billion oysters mm -hmm. in the water and to clean the water. Yeah. So it's a, it's actually a really simplified mm -hmm. way of doing restoration. There's a lot of people that are like filtering through mechanical means or by deploying nets and filters and, and things in the water that's moving to remove macro pollution like trash. Mm -hmm. But plastic breaks down into yeah. smaller, smaller pieces. And so it's really impossible to remove all of it. Whereas in the water soluble pollutants just travel right through and there's a lot of in hunters point shipyard in san francisco they did a whole spray down of uh, these ships that were in the bikini atoll nuclear tests mm -hmm. and so this is like cesium and all these nuclear yeah. peptides that are present like in the water all over hunters point and i think with some careful placement of these enclosures with tons and hundreds of thousands of oysters mm -hmm that could then be remineralized in the shell formation and deposited at the bottom mm -hmm. in, a, in an oyster shell. And not to mention the oyster shells, when they dissolve, it's like they're calcium carbonate. So they are like an Alka-Seltzer tablet mm -hmm. for the ocean. So to reverse ocean acidification at the same time you remove pollution, really you just need billions of oysters, both live and dead, to be returned. Yeah, okay, so let me just make sure I'm understanding this. So. Let's just say we had $2 billion that somebody gifted you with to do this project. You could take that, put 2 billion oysters into the San Francisco Bay in these baskets where the oysters, it sounds like they don't have to attach onto columns. They already have a structure that they can be in that attracts other oysters that are, you know, natural oysters that would come anyway because there's more there and this would filter the water it sounds like pretty quickly like how actually if there were like, two billion oysters it would filter the volume of the bay mm -hmm. weekly it would the whole bay would be re filtered mm -hmm. weekly it'd be it'd be clear water that'd be clean water yeah amazing okay anything i didn't ask you that you want to talk about i have a question yeah do you eat oyster oysters i eat oysters i haven't eaten many of them recently <laughs> but we do shuck them for people at the farmer's market and for every one they purchase we put two in the water for restoration so it's like a bucks for shucks that's been enhanced because we're we're a non-profit so we're not taking any profit from the the shucking of the oysters mm -hmm. but yeah i still eat them but it does seem a little bit weird as part of the tour we give people in sausalito when they sit down at the picnic table to get an overview of the whole bay and oyster culture and bioremediation. I give them some of the same history that I've been talking about. I go down to, to the shoreline and I find a native oyster on a rock and then I offer them oysters from my satchel with ice that I'm mm -hmm. able to eat. But I, most of them, once they realize that oysters are really helpful in filtering the water, they just don't even want to eat oysters mm -hmm. anymore. 
And then we take the satchel full of oysters on ice and go right down to the boat dock and put them in the aquarium to temper them before going underneath into the enclosures where they'll live for hopefully for a long time. Very cool. So, okay, and where do people find you? Oysterculture.org. Oysterculture.org. Or you can just scan the QR code. Yes. Right and your name? Your name? Yeah, your name? Say your full name. My name is Joe Ruder. You can find me on Instagram. Like <laughs> hashtag Little Joey Oyster. L I L Joey Oyster. But I have also put a lot of my research on the website, and yeah, you can you can check it out if you like. Get involved if you'd like. And yeah, make a donation if you'd like. Thank you. Okay, and say your website one more time. Oysterculture.org. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. You're welcome.